Today we take a look at how can ensure Malaysians can breathe easily again after two years of economic uncertainty. A more holistic approach to rehabilitate Malaysia's socio-economy. That's coming up. Don't go anywhere. Money Matters starts now. Hello there and welcome to TV Tiga's flagship business program, Money Matters. I'm Azaria Tagaya, your host for this week's episode. And today we are joined by the Chief Executive Officer for the Center for Market Education, CME, Dr. Carmelo Ferlito. Dr. Ferlito, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, thanks to you for having me. Thank it's you. our pleasure. Now, so the budget, the 2022 budget was tabled last week by Finance Minister Datuk Sri Tengku Zafrul Abdul Aziz. And um, with 332.1 billion ringgit allocated, it's the highest in the country's history. So how can we, I think this happens every year when the budget is tabled, there's this buzz surrounding it. So everyone's exciting about these promises, so to speak. Uh, how can we ensure that this budget will not turn out to be um, an exercise that actually promises much but delivers quite little? Well, actually, I would uh, rephrase the question. I would say, do we really want that the old budget gets implemented? And, and I say this because obviously the task of politicians is to make people happy yes. in the short term. The task of economists is to remind politicians and people that these things don't come for free. Mm. So um, what I appreciate in the budget in general is the spirit. So there is a, the, the attempt to address some fundamental issues that were created by the pandemic and mostly by the way in which the pandemic was handled. But yes. uh, um, I would have tackled that issues in a different way, if I may say, and I would have played on a much less ambitious budget, mm -hmm. but readdressing those issues uh, in a more structural way in a, in a process that is outside of the budget and maybe can be even cheaper with uh, structural reforms rather than directly spending money. I see. Uh, how would you propose that Malaysia does this? Well, I, I would say, again, um, there are some structural issues that are uh, touched in the budget. In example, the attempt to extend, to widen the tax base. Yes. Uh, but because of the instrument that the budget is, mm -hmm. uh, this has come probably in a uh, in a limited way mm -hmm. and probably not in the right way. I, I keep on saying I would uh, like to see better taxes and better enforcement rather than more taxes per se. Uh, so I would address this issue uh, with a more holistic tax reform. This is just to give you an example. Okay. Uh, what do you think are some of the good points of the budget that was tabled last Friday by our finance minister? Some things that you think were pertinent to address and they were addressed correctly this time around. For me, the main good points were uh, the substantial funds that were addressed to strengthening the healthcare system mm -hmm. and the education also, uh, the education sector. I think that the, the, there is not, not much debate on that, but I think this is very important. And the way in which this money mm -hmm. will be used mm -hmm. for both uh, the education uh, sector and the healthcare system, I think will be very determinant of uh, the future, what now is uh, uh, fashion to say, resilience of yes. Malaysia as a system. Yes, indeed. Now let's take a look at uh, a look back at the breakdown of the national budget this time around. Now, 233.5 billion ringgit in operating expenditure, 75.6 billion ringgit in development expenditure, and 23 billion ringgit for the COVID-19 fund. Now, the operating expenditure, 233.5 billion ringgit. Now, do you think this is within the expected range? I think yes, uh, it has to be expected. Uh, this doesn't mean that it's necessarily good, but mm. uh, uh, this means that obviously the size of the government is, uh, is an important size. So uh, we have to address this issue. The Malaysian government is a government that is growing in size, and we have to ask ourselves is, if this is 
desirable. desirable. Yes. Uh, if you look even at the, the projection for growth for next year in the budget, um, uh, the, the government set only 4% of growth for private investment, but 26% for um, government investment. So this means that the government conceives a higher role uh, for itself or themselves to be played in the economy. Mm -hmm. And this can create uh, issues in the future. Like, uh, again, I, I like to stress uh, the importance of unintended consequences. So uh, very much will depend how all these expenditures are financed. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, one uh, important uh, risk that needs to be addressed uh, is the risk of inflation. Mm. Uh, we have seen this happening already in the West, in particular in the United States. Wages and prices have not uh, grown at this pace in decades. Yes. Uh, in Malaysia, we don't see this yet because the, economy, the economic recovery is not here yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but when the money supply grows at a faster pace, uh, then uh, the output, then the GDP, then the risks for uh, a permanent and high inflation are very serious. So mm. this is something that we need to, to address, mm. considering the way in which the government is going to source the funds that they want to spend. I see. Okay, so the 2022 budget appeared to uh, offer a holistic approach to rehabilitate Malaysia's socio-economy, but ever since it's been tabled, uh, analysts have said that perhaps more proactive measures will be needed. How do you think this can be managed? This is very, and it's very important issue. The, the idea that the budget address uh, uh, Malaysian structural problems in an holistic way is probably an overstatement. But uh, indeed, it's not the task of the budget to address uh, structural reforms. Uh, but there are indeed uh, bigger issues that need to be addressed. Uh, and uh, I have already mentioned uh, tax reform, in example, but also uh, the ability of Malaysia to attract uh, FDIs, uh, the immigration policy. So all these issues will, and the way in which Malaysia decide to tackle them, mm. will. Uh, uh, address the way in we, and if Malaysia is going to grow in the next year and at which pace. I see. Now, how Malaysia is going to grow is going to depend uh, highly on uh, what the government is doing and also some of the cash aid that's being handed out. We'll talk more about that after the break, but now we are going for a short breather. Don't go anywhere. Money Matters will be back after this.
Welcome back to Money Matters. You're still with me, Azaria Tagaya, and we're still joined by our guest, Dr. Carmelo Ferlito, the CEO for the Center for Market Education, CME. Dr. Ferlito, before the break, we, take, uh, we took a look at uh, the basic breakdown of the national budget for 2022. Now, we want to talk a little bit about the cash assistance. Now, there has been uh, a lot of emphasis for cash aid for the B40 group to help them go through the COVID-19 pandemic, but not much has been uh, done to actually address the middle class and the M40 group. Now, how do you think the M40 are actually affected by the pandemic and can they survive without uh, assistance? Okay, I would split this issue into two different and separate issues. The first one is uh, the attempt of the government to help people that were harmed, mm -hmm. uh, not really by the pandemic directly, but I would say mostly by lockdowns. Uh, many people lost jobs, businesses closed down. And I think uh, this is a very important topic. So this kind of cash ads or one-off expenditures that have been uh, foreseen with the budget are offering a temporary support, a temporary relief. But um, what are we going to say for those businesses that uh, have been closed down for good? So this is a problem that probably has not been addressed sufficiently, not in the sense that we need to spend more money, mm -hmm. but uh, how do we create the uh, right environment, the right ecosystem for these businesses eventually to re-emerge yes. or for those people that uh, counted, uh, that relied on that businesses to find another way to earn an income. Mm. Because now the issue is not to give uh, a uh, few hundreds ringgit to households, mm -hmm. but to create the conditions for that households to stand back on their feet and to get uh, and to get a job. Um, the second part, I think that uh, we are uh, broadening uh, reasoning in terms of B40 and M40, but these groups comprise millions of people and households, and and therefore the situations may be very different uh, between people and people, individuals and individuals, families and families. I think that here we should open a, a broader reflection on the role that eventually state, the states and local governments can have in addressing these issues because states and local governments are closer to the people. So probably they are better positioned to really understand which are the situations that needs to be addressed mm. rather than with generalized subsidies with more targeted helps looking into the situation. So yes. uh, this problem probably calls for, uh, for a fiscal reform that includes the possibility for uh, local governments to mm. collect revenues through the tax system. Uh, not uh, adding on to what is collected by the central government, mm. but replacing the system of collection. So I think that uh, if we had a sort of a fiscal devolution, this would uh, help uh, um, uh, the, the situations and this kind of uh, problems on the ground to be addressed uh, in a more efficient way. I see. Now, speaking about tax, uh, in the budget, there's uh, an attempt to actually increase the tax base. And you mentioned this earlier on as well. Uh, how do you think we can address uh, the need to uh, have a more holistic uh, tax reform? I think that the basic problem indeed is really uh, the tax base in the sense that a very small percentage of individuals and businesses actually pay taxes. How we increase this? Mm. So the point is not really to add on new taxes, but how to get uh, uh, the maximum we can from the existing taxes. And we are not working on that. I would uh, also implement, in example, uh, special programs for uh, small and medium, from, for, for micro businesses, uh, on the example of what has been done in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, Indonesia uh, created a system whereby uh, micro businesses are pushed to enter, uh, the, 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 to exit the shadow economy and to pay a small percentage of tax on self-declared revenues. But in exchange, they get freed of a lot of uh, bureaucracy and paperwork, mm -hmm. uh, accounting, reporting, and etc. This is something that we should think about. And, and the second point is uh, 
to rebalance uh, uh, the, the role of income and uh, indirect taxation. Mm -hmm. I'm in favor of a shift toward indirect taxation, and I think there is a broad agreement among analysts that abandoning GST was probably not the right move. So probably we should reintroduce it with some adjustment, but yeah. this, is a, this is something that we really need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, offsetting uh, this new tax with uh, a little decrease in income tax. Mm, I see. Okay, now the budget is also seen as the first time that the government and the opposition actually had a meaningful pre-budget session. Uh, in terms of this uh, collaboration between the opposition and the government, do you think that this should be a consistent pact uh, in all matters and not just in the national budget? I have mixed feelings about this, uh, actually. So on one side, it's good to see political cooperation, in particular in a moment of national emergency. Mm. So there are moments in which uh, political differences need to be set aside. So yes. probably this is that moment. But to have this uh, as uh, the rule is probably not right because indeed the political discourse is made of uh, conflictualities, is made of differences. And if uh, the difference between uh, the ruling coalition and the opposition mm -hmm. is going to, uh, to disappear, then uh, the, the whole meaning of the democratic system uh, fades uh, somehow. So, so we need to have a difference between the political supplies so, so that the people can choose uh, out of differences, not out of equality, because then if everything is the same, we don't have any more a yes. political market. Yes, indeed. <laughs> now, we also want to talk a little bit about uh, the projected GDP growth for the country, as well as a very important factor, I think, when it comes to uh, economic growth, which is uh, foreign direct investment. But that is coming up uh, after the break. We're going to go for another short breather. Don't go anywhere. After this, we're coming back with more on Money Matters. with us on Money Matters talking about the 2022 budget with our guest, the CEO for the Center for Market Education, CME, Dr. Carmelo Ferlito. Dr. Ferlito, before the break, we talked a lot about the 2022 budget, but now uh, we want to uh, take a look back at February this year, where the finance minister said that the government will address uh, the country's structural issues in the 2022 budget. So now that it's been tabled, where can we actually see this being addressed in the budget? Well, I think, first of all, that the budget is probably not the instrument that we 
should use to address structural issues mm. that require broader reforms that go beyond the scope of the budget. Mm -hmm. So we can see some attempt, like the, the money that have been um, allocated for the healthcare system, for yes. education, uh, the money that has been, or, or the, the, the way in which uh, taxes have been addressed. So uh, we, we can see some flashes here and there, but I'm afraid that uh, um, this will not be enough mm -hmm. or doesn't go necessarily in the right direction and yes, we need yes. uh, probably a, a more general reflection on these, uh, um, on these issues mm -hmm. that involve also the dialogue with the opposition that goes through a proper parliamentary uh, debate. Yes. And, uh, we, we can't address education reforms in the budget or tax reform simply in the budget. We need a broader conversation, I guess. I see, indeed. Uh, now, there's been a projected growth of 5.5 to 6.5 percent for the GDP for 2022. Uh, also, at the same time, there's been a lot of several uh, initiatives to help uh, SMEs, businesses affected by the pandemic. How far do you think uh, such assistance can have uh, an impact on the growth for the projected GDP for 2022? Okay, on the assistance directly, uh, I have to say, let's be very careful. Mm. Because uh, uh, when government uh, intervenes so directly in supporting businesses, we uh, encounter the risks of long-term dangerous unintended consequences. Mm. Um, it's a little bit like uh, uh, getting drunk. It's pleasant at the beginning, but uh, uh, the consequences later are not that pleasant and you need uh, to take a very radical remedy mm -hmm. if you want to get out of it. So, um, and this peculiarly um, I mentioned because you see when the government spend uh, money to support businesses, what happens is that uh, um, the resources are not necessarily addressed in a way that is consistent with consumer preferences and mm. with the structure of production that is present in a certain moment. So certain economic initiatives may arise not because they are consistent with the economic structure mm. of a certain moment in a certain place, but just because there is the support. So this support creates jobs, obviously. Mm. These jobs uh, create other jobs in turn because people get income and with their income spend money and create a lot of spillover effects. Yes, yes. But if all these job creations, all these uh, uh, economic positive effects were not consistent with the needs of the market, mm -hmm. the moment in which the support is withdrawn, all this castle will fall down. And we fall down with all the spillover that has been created. Mm -hmm. So the final, um, the final situation may be even worse than the initial one. So we have to be careful when we do this and we have to be as much as possible respectful of the signals that come from the market. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in addressing the situation of our SMEs, I would try rather than simply spending money in wage subsidies, in example, uh, I would try to create an environment which is more conducive mm -hmm. uh, to uh, economic development in an indirect way. Mm -hmm. uh, in example, be certain on the tax system, show yes. the direction that you are going to take on taxation, yes. show the direction that you are going to take on immigration, in example, because uh, we cannot hide behind the finger. Uh, foreign workers are necessary for the Malaysian economy. Mm. We can't do without it. So we need to be clear on this, uh, on this policy. We need to be clear on the direction that we are taking on international travels, not only for tourism. I think that we have overemphasized the role that international travels play for tourism and we have not stressed enough how international travels are necessary for business people mm. to conduct business and therefore to create long-term positive consequences for yes, the country. Yes. So uh, this is the way in which I would uh, address, uh, address the problem and I would address uh, the potential for economic growth in the next years. I see. Now, With less direct role of the government and more uh, institutional reform and clarity in the direction that needs to be taken. Because this will create economic initiatives that are there to stay. 
stable and conducive of long-term sound growth. Yes, yes. And talking about long-term uh, growth and recovery, in order to create a stable uh, recovery for the country, um, how can the government actually initiate uh, or stimulate private investments for both the domestic and foreign investments for the country? As I mentioned, the first and most important thing is clarity. Mm. And we need clarity on these three issues. Taxation, so we need a reform also of the uh, incentive schemes that are offered by institutions like, uh, like MIDA, mm -hmm. in example. Uh, then immigration, what we want to do with foreign workers, with expatriates. And we know that also the rules for hiring expatriates have been uh, made more complicated mm. at the beginning of this year. And then uh, which directions are we going to take on international travel? So I think these are uh, the most important things that uh, uh, need to be addressed in order to launch a signal to world businesses. The way in which we are going to address this will very much determine if Malaysia is going to be, again, a competitive country for FDIs. Considering that, compared with when Malaysia became indeed a very attractive pole for FDIs, yeah. now we have a much more aggressive competition from our neighbors like Indonesia and Vietnam indeed. or even Philippines. Yes. This was not the case 20, 25 or 30 years ago. Yeah. We need to take that into account, so it means that we need to be even more aggressive than them. Yes, indeed. Understood. Now, finally, Dr. Felito, what would be your forecast for the economic outlook for uh, the whole of 2022? I think that we should uh, uh, avoid this kind of forecast. We have seen in example institution, even like the World Bank, that did predictions last year and they kept on revising these predictions because the scenario that we have before us is an evolving scenario mm -hmm. and we need to take into account this uh, uh, evolutionary scenario. We don't know uh, how it's going to evolve the pandemic situation, if we would need another mass vaccination campaign, uh, for how long international borders will be closed and when they are going to reopen. So as far as this situation uh, are not clarified, it is very difficult to, uh, to, get, uh, uh, to get a sure prediction. If uh, the political scenario is getting stable, mm. if international borders are going to open, if uh, immigration rules are getting uh, clarified, then we can hope, yes, to grow between 5 and 6 percent last year, uh, the, sorry, this year, next year, like yeah. uh, MOF predicted. But again, is if, if, and if. Yes. I guess only time will tell, Dr. Felito. Indeed. Thank you so much for joining us on Money Matters today. We really do appreciate your time. Thanks to you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank our you. pleasure. And thank you to you as well for tuning in this week. Hopefully you enjoyed our discussion today on the 2022 budget. Don't forget to tune in again next week for more Money Insights That Matter. I'm Azaria Tagaya. Thank you for tuning in. See you next time.